Hello and welcome. I'm Carolyn Griminger with the Public Affairs Forum of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin. Our program's mission is to nourish the mind and spirit and serve social justice. Our forums occur on most Sundays at noon and are free and open to the public. For more information about our Public Affairs Forum, you can go to our church website at www.austinuu.org. Today's speaker is John Busey. His topic is Williamson County, where it's been, where it's going. John Busey is the Williamson County Democratic Party Chair. Williamson County's Democratic Party is growing by leaps and bounds, including electing, electing a Precinct 1 Commissioner Terry Cook in November. Join us as we welcome John Busey as he is discussing where Williamson County has been and where we are heading. John is a graduate of Austin College and a proud son of Central Texas. His roots are strong here. John is a proven business leader. He is the founder and president of the Texas Charter School Academic and Athletic League, an organized competitive sports league serving over 130 of Texas charter schools. John is not new to politics, having served as an assistant director of canvassing for Texas during the 2006 elections, as a precinct captain, through volunteering on numerous campaigns and serving as a delegate to the 2012 State Party Convention. John is a proud husband to Molly, a Texas public school teacher. Let's welcome Mr. B.C. Hi, everyone. I want to thank you all for inviting me out to speak to you today. Thank you, Donna, for the invitation. It is very flattering as a Williamson County resident to be invited down to Travis County to talk to you all and to get to be a part of your lecture series, a series that has had so many worthy individuals participate in it. I'm humbled to be here and to be invited. My name is John Busey. I am the party chair of the Williamson County Democratic Party, and I'm a proud Wilco Dem. I tend to open up most of my speeches that way because one of the most crucial tactics to us building towards our success has been building pride and being a Democrat in Williamson County. I love being a Texan, and I love this state. I spend most of my free time in Port Aransas on our beautiful beaches, or in my cabins in Terlingua Ranch, just outside of Big Bend National Park. This is a beautiful state with great people and great resources, but I think you'll agree with me, we have quite a lot of bad elected officials. My home county of Williamson County is no exception, and in fact, it might be the rule, or at least it has been, but things are getting better. I wanna tell you a little bit about myself. I think it is important to understand me and how I see the world and in, in order to understand why I am fighting the sometimes daunting and very uphill battle that we're all fighting in Williamson County. I was born in Austin at St. David's Hospital. I spent my summers and holidays in Austin, but I grew up in a split household where I spent the bulk of my time in Dallas. My parents, although divorced, were a great team in raising my siblings and me. My parents stayed very close along with my stepfather when we were young and they all played a role in raising us as a team. They are incredibly supportive, and they have encouraged us to follow our dreams and ambitions, and they have always been a rock to support us in times of struggle. In fact, my dad is here with me today and my godfather, so I'm happy to have them in the audience. I am someone that has always been eager to jump into new things head first, sometimes to a fault. I take risks that many wouldn't take because they would think they were either too inexperienced or afraid of what would happen if they fell. I've never had that fear, and it's because I have such a supportive family safety net. And it's not just that they love me, but I also knew my parents and family would be there to help me if and when I fall. I know I have been fortunate to have this. It's a privilege that has allowed me to take risks that many wouldn't have had the opportunity to take. As a young person growing up in Dallas, my mom and stepfather were very involved in politics. I grew up around campaigns, and elected officials. My family was very involved in multiple state house elections with former state representatives Harriet Earhart and Jesse Oliver. We were also involved in Ron Kirk's U.S. Senate run. Growing up around these very influential individuals, I was inspired at a young age to want to serve through government. 
I knew early on that we needed progressive legislators that would work towards governmental policies that would support and benefit people's lives. I believe that we all should work to improve our own lives and the lives of those around us. I believe in the idea that we are our brother's keepers. Since I've had such a fortunate upbringing, I believe it is my responsibility to serve however I can, to devote my life to a bigger cause. I grew up with Martin Luther King Jr. as a role model. He was a man that believed that we should all be treated equally. I take inspiration from his words and I have ever since I was a child. A passage he wrote I think is pertinent to all of us and our lives. I ask you to bear with me as I read it. King said, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life in history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked, and dejected with a lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of men does not remain at the flood, it ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residue of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. There is an invisible book of life that faithfully records our vigilance or our neglect. The moving finger writes and having writ moves on. King goes on to say, now let us begin. Now let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter but beautiful struggle for a new world. King was speaking of Vietnam, but we can derive meaning from it today as well. And the message, I think, shapes my personality. It highlights how I think and why I share the urgency of now. King could have just as easily been talking about the urgency of now when it comes to our fight to protect Americans' health care. He could have spoken of the urgency of now when it comes to fighting for our environment. He could have spoken of the urgency of now when it comes to fighting for our public schools and our teachers. King could have spoken of the urgency of now when it comes to fighting for equal rights for all people. This message would set a driving tone for me, a tone that I would always try to come back to, and that is a commitment to action and service now. After graduating from high school, I went on to Austin College in Sherman, Texas, home of the Fighting Kangaroos. After college, I moved back to Austin, where here I was a door-to-door -door fundraiser for the Howard Dean 50 State Plan. From there, I worked the 2007 legislative session, and then at the age of 23, I started my own small business. I did most things wrong early on, but through hard work, I was able to balance the company, and it has grown into a successful organization. During the 2008 campaign, I was a precinct captain for uh, candidate Obama, and I spent some time as a precinct chair in Travis County. In 2013, I married my beautiful wife, Molly Busey, who is here with us today. Molly is a public school teacher, a small business owner, and she's currently serving as a Democratic precinct chair in Williamson County. She is vital to my success in life. She sacrifices so much to be at all of my events, and she has truly been my biggest supporter. After getting married, we moved into the Anderson Mill area, across the line into Williamson County, near my grandparents, who have now been living there for about 35 years. I immediately started attending Williamson County Democratic Party events and became close with many of the party leaders. I ran for state representative of District 136 in 2014. District 136 is made up of Northwest Austin, Cedar Park, Leander, and the Brushy Creek area in Williamson County. Now, some may say that Williamson County has been wandering around the desert for 40 years. That's not totally off base. This is the county that wrongfully convicted Michael Morden for a murder he didn't commit. Then the Williamson County officials refused for a long time to honestly look at the evidence, and finally, 25 years later, Michael Morden was cleared of the crime on DNA test. The original prosecutor, Ken Anderson, who at the time of exoneration in 2013 was serving as the district court judge in Williamson County, was found guilty of tampering with evidence in the case, but ultimately he only served five days in prison for a crime that had a man unjustly served 25 years. The last time Texas voted for a Democrat for president was in 1976. In Williamson County, the furthest back I could track down was 1992. 
The Democrats and Bill Clinton got 31% of the vote, with Bush getting 42%. As we hit the 2000 election, this got even worse for us, with W getting 67% of the vote and Gore getting only 27%. At this point, Williamson County was a very dark red place to be. In 2008, we had a bright light. As part of the Obama wave, Williamson County elected a Democrat to the State House, Deanna Maldonado. She won a very close race. In response to this, the Wilco Republicans mobilized to unseat her, spending $1.2 million to take the seat back in 2010. Deanna spent an additional $800,000, so that's $2 million for a so-called part-time job that pays around $7,000 a year. After that, Williamson County went through some very challenging days. We had gone back to being a completely red county, and we would stay that way for the next eight years. Now, I was not living in Wilco at the time, but as the story goes, in that 2010 race, we experienced some of our own version of Robert Morrow, your recent eccentric Republican Party chair. Our Wilco Democratic Party chair at the time, who only won by about 15 votes in a contested race, came out in support of the Republican challenger against our own Democratic incumbent. This, as you can imagine, created a firestorm of trouble that ultimately resulted in the county party getting the state Democratic Party involved to help oust this rogue chair. You may not know this, but if you are an elected member of the party, even as a precinct chair, you are required to support the Democratic candidate if there is one. So his actions were an impeachable offense. This sent our party spiraling downward. The secretary at the time, Karen Carter, was elected by the precinct chair to fill in as party chair, and this is a position she served in for four years until I was elected. Karen did a great job bringing stability to the party, and she helped turn it into a good organization. But I knew if we were going to be successful, we needed to get the party to be an aggressive, grassroots-focused organization. Now, in 2014, as I already said, I ran for the Texas House. The first thing I did when debating that run, besides talking it over with my family, and putting myself through legislature school at my dining room table, was drive to Dallas and get the advice of the former state reps I had volunteered with growing up. Representative Jesse Oliver's first question when I told him I was running for the Texas House in Williamson County was to ask if I had switched to the Republican Party. Maybe it was in that moment that I should have thought better about what I was about to do. When I walked into Representative Earhart's house, the first thing she did was scold me for not wearing a name tag, something she said all candidates must do at all times. And then she filled me with about 20 pages of notes and advice. It was clear I had a lot to learn, but as I said, I am not one to wait until a perfect situation. Regardless of the outcome the, of the election, my campaign implemented groundbreaking grassroots efforts, especially for Williamson County. With the help of fantastic volunteers, a great staff, and my family, we knocked on 75,000 doors and made 30,000 phone calls. Our campaign believed that we would be outspent and we were by the tune of $500,000 to about 160000 But we were all committed to the idea that we would not be outworked. We were not the most experienced campaigners, and we couldn't afford consultants. So whenever we were in doubt, we knew that we should go directly to the voters, knock doors, and ask for their support. This is my number one message of the day today. And that is, if you want to succeed, you have to go to the voters and have person-to-person -person conversations. To succeed at this, you have to put in the effort and the hard work. Again, I came out short in that race, but the race did build a strong level of grassroots support for change. Individuals that worked on my campaign were vo motivated to make sure Williamson County never took an off year. We stayed focused on building party infrastructure, and we formed a democratic club committed to the cause of year-round grassroots development. We worked on identifying voters, registering voters, and recruiting and supporting candidates in local elections. I had initially planned to run for the House again in 2016, but I concluded that our party did not have the infrastructure to win that House race. So I changed my focus and decided that what was needed at that moment was leadership that was committed to grassroots organizing strategies. I have a personal philosophy to life, and it's tied in this principle. Most of the time, I will not be the smartest person in the room, if ever. I will not be the most experienced person in the room but I should always be committed to being the hardest worker in the room. When I'm evaluating an individual, what I care most about is how hard are you willing to work. One of the inspiring things about being involved in a county party where you don't have any elected officials is that the individuals that are involved 
are 100% dedicated to the cause. The summer soldiers that Thomas Paine referred to had all gone home. So although we were a small group, we were a committed group of individuals. So with a group of hard workers, a plan to build the party infrastructure, implement grassroots techniques, and a commitment to outwork our opponents, we laid out a four-year strategy and I filed to run for party chair. The four-year plan would grow grassroots activities, increase fundraising, and build party infrastructure by establishing support clubs and recruiting and training precinct chairs. We were also committed to running a coordinated campaign and really outwork our opponents in our targeted area. When I took over as chair, I didn't know that we would find success to the degree that we did as early as we did. I thought we had a real shot to win the Austin District 6 race. We had a great candidate in Jimmy Flanagan, and we were planning to coordinate with the Travis County Democrats to take this seat from the Republicans. In the Commissioner 1 race, I was confident in our candidate Terry Cook and our effort, but I wasn't sure what the outcome of the race would be. And something I struggled with was defining victory and setting ambitious but realistic goals. When you're dealing with a county party that has perpetually lost, you want to set ambitious but achievable goals because the last thing this group needed was another setback. However, I was committed to this race because part of that four-year plan was getting a major victory. I didn't know at the time if it would come in 2016 race or if we would have to build towards the future, but we knew the best partisan race we had on paper was the county commissioner one race. This area is made up of mostly Austin-Williamson County and Western Round Rock both areas that are trending Democratic. We hadn't broke through here in the past, but we were getting very close. In 2008, we only lost this race by a little over 300 votes. Unfortunately for our growth, we didn't have a candidate in 2012, and we suffered from redistricting, both causing us to take a step backwards. However, in spite of this setback, I knew we had a real shot on pay. And on top of it being close to being winnable, we had another reason to target the commissioner's race. And that was because there was so much growing frustration with the current court. You might already know this because local news and the statesmen covered it regularly, but the Williamson County Republicans had a major scandal on their hands. The commissioner's court in 2013 was conducting interviews for a constable vacancy. In these interviews, they asked constitutionally illegal questions such as, what are your religious beliefs? How do you feel about abortion? And what are your thoughts on gay marriage? These questions are highly illegal questions to ask in an interview. KXAN pointed out that federal law prohibits employers, public or private, from using religious views in the hiring process. It's treated the same as race, gender, or age. The Texas Bill of Rights is also clear saying no religious test should be required as a qualification to any office. But the Wilco Republicans didn't seem to care. Precinct 1 Commissioner at the time, Lisa Berkman, was film saying, what I've said before, and I'll say it again, I've asked a question on their view on gay marriage and their view on abortion to all applicants for Precinct 3 Constable, except for Kevin Stoffel during the interviews. And that's because he had already gone through an interview process earlier where they asked him at that point. She said she asked these questions because when she was running for commissioner before being elected in 2004, Justice of the Peace, Edna Stott, asked her for her views on gay marriage and abortion. Berkman said she told Stott she was against abortion rights and against gay marriage, but that her answer was really long and complicated. She goes on to say, Judge Stott told me if I wanted to win that I needed to come up with a more concise answer, she testified, clearly confusing a different conversation from a political campaign and from a legal formal job interview. Fellow Commissioner Long, who is still serving on the court, testified during the trial that, applicant, that the applicant's responses to questions about their views on same-sex marriage and abortion mattered because the voters in Precinct 3 have a history of electing people who subscribe to the Republican platform and are staunchly conservative. Well, the courts disagreed. This past December, a federal judge determined Williamson County Commissioner Cynthia Long and Lisa Berkman violated the civil rights of Robert Lloyd. The judge stated the court finds that Lloyd's equal protection rights under the 14th Amendment were violated when he asked questions about his views on same-sex marriage, abortion, and religious affiliation during the course of an interview for an appointment to a Williamson County Constable position. The court further finds that the appropriate remedy is the imposition of the following permanent injunction. Williamson County officials and their agents are prevented from asking any questions, written or oral, of any applicant to an appointed constable position 
regarding their views on same-sex marriage, abortion, or religious affiliation. If they are to do so, they will be found in contempt of court. This incident, not, not only being a total violation of the law and an embarrassment on our county, has also been a major financial burden on the taxpayers, resulting in costs of over $500,000. Lisa Berkman ended up not seeking re-election in this race for Commissioner One Spot, so we had an additional reason to go all in on that election. We had a potentially winnable race on paper, we had an electorate fed up with this scandal, and we had an open seat. I know here in Travis County, y'all have an abundance of success electing Democrats, and we're all very envious throughout the state. But you might find that some of what we are doing can be implemented in suburban areas of your county are effective in the few remaining Republican areas, if so inclined to work those. So with the plan, a bunch of very passionate volunteers and the commitment to work for change, we are ready to take on the great challenge of electing Democrats in Williamson County. President Kennedy speaks of great challenges when he spoke at Rice University saying, but why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon, he said. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Now, I know politics in Williamson County is not rocket science, but the task of electing a Democrat is a hard, daunting challenge there. We were determined to bring change here, even though it was hard, because this goal would be the measure of our abilities and because it needed to be done and we intended to win. I have a handout, and I would like to go through it with all of you. It's, I think Donna's going to pass it around. Our all right, I, I want to start, we're going to do this in two parts. I want to start with the front, which is how do we start finding success in Williamson County? I'd like to go through it. I've given this presentation in some of our other counties as a guest speaker talking about, it's mainly in red areas, rural areas. So I know, as I said, y'all have an abundance of Democrats, but I think there's some lessons here that we're doing with grassroots that can be beneficial to all people. Um, so how do we start finding success in Williamson County? And what do we do in the 16 campaign? The first thing was we were committed to our four driving principles, and that was a commitment to grassroots, to building the party infrastructure, to increasing fundraising, and building pride in being a Democrat in Williamson County. I think it's important as we take on this task to remember our objective as a county party. And I believe our number one objective is to elect Democrats. I think so often we can get, I don't want to say distracted, but consumed with the news of the day, this issue and that issue, and I, those things are important. They help define why we choose to be Democrats. But as a county party and a county chair, we have one clear objective, and that is to win elections. So that's what we have to stay focused on and let that drive our actions. Old-fashioned grassroots with smart targeting through VAN is our model. Let me tell you briefly what VAN is in case you don't know. VAN is the Voter Activation Network. It's a database that Democrats all over this nation use to identify and target voters. So it lets us know how you vote, when you vote. We don't know your individual candidates, but we know what primaries you vote in, how consistent of a voter you are. And we use that to target strong Democrats, to get them engaged on a volunteer and donation level. We also will target unknown or less likely Democrats, Democrats to make sure we're pushing them into the polls. And then we'll take the strong Republican list and we'll intentionally ignore it so we, we don't remind them about the election. Um, we use that van to implement our smart targeting. So we go to regular volunteer block walks year round, not just during election time. We have phone banks and voter registration drives. By doing this regularly, it's kind of like practice makes perfect. So we don't let our, our precinct chairs and our volunteers get too much time off. We try to keep going all the time to keep us comfortable with it, keep us active, and to continue to build the database so we have a stronger list to work off of. We believed in targeting, targeting, targeting. What do I mean by that? We were going to go all in on this Commissioner 1 map. It overlapped with Austin District 6 quite a bit, so those precincts were our primary focus in this election. It, sometimes in other areas of the state where they haven't been working, it's going to take a long-term plan. You've got to work those overlapping areas over and over, and you'll see the dividends pay off. We work overlapping areas as much as we possibly can. That means working municipal elections. We work primaries, especially uncontested ones. If it's uncontested, which many of your Travis County ones will be with incumbents, 
it's a great opportunity to go to these unknown voters and mobilize more less likely voters into the election process. So it's an opportunity that shouldn't be missed, especially because the benefits we'll have for us electing candidates statewide. And, and then we also work the constitutional elections. So after the legislative session, there's usually a constitutional election in what's referred to usually as the interim year, but it's not, and it's another election where you can have a purpose to mobilize voters and get them engaged. So we do that. In 2012, we had a candidate for the state house that did most of their work in the 100 precincts. In 2014, I talked about my race, but on top of that, we had Matt Stilwell and Jimmy Flanagan also running for city council, working that same area. And you can see, although with these numbers here, we had 12 Republican precincts in 12, 12 Republican precincts again in 14 in these 100s, but I'll highlight that was a governor year where Democrats usually struggle and, and don't have as high a turnout. So to maintain that level was progress. And then you can really see in 2016 where Jimmy was running again, we had our coordinated campaign, and you had Terry Cook running for the commissioner race, all targeting these 100 precincts, so these, six, these uh, 22 precincts, aggressively. And you can see how it paid off with six of those precincts flipping from the Republican. To the you must have smart, hardworking candidates. That may sound like a no-brainer, but in our rural areas, in our red areas, it's hard to recruit candidates into what is considered a losing race, a losing battle. Um, it's not that there aren't capable people in all of our counties throughout Texas, but it's hard to convince someone to take that sacrifice. But if you don't do it, if you don't have candidates, then you miss the opportunity to build the grassroots. So what we're trying to do is first recruit candidates that are willing to run, and if we can't find it, then call on our party leaders, our precinct chairs, our party chairs, to file and run. Because if you don't have someone, you can't build. And if you can get someone to do that, then it gives you that opportunity to work the grassroots and move the needle. And the closer you get, the more attractive those races are going to be to high quality candidates. So one way or another, you've got to put people in these races and you've got to have individuals that will be committed to the grassroots. Get your message and group in front of people, especially in these targeted areas. We had a great series last uh, year. We went to the local paper in Williamson County. We proposed the idea of a, a program called Point Counterpoint in this. I wrote a column and the Republican Party chair would write a column. They'd be put side by side. The paper would pick the topic. We did this for six months, I believe. And they would give us the topic. These were not supposed to be attack ads or hit pieces. There were a lot of rules in that sense. But what it really showed was this is our view and issue on a local topic, and this is their view and issue on a local, or sometimes national topics. And I think by doing that, we find in these red areas and some of these rural areas, a lot of people say they're Republicans. When they start reading our issues, they become more open to us as a party. So it was a great free avenue for us to get to stand side by side in a peaceful manner, but still show our differences and highlight our differences. So that's one thing we did. I, I recommend everybody trying to do that if you can get your local party and your local papers to agree to it. Facebook advertising, we do, it's affordable. We do targeted Facebook advertising in these precincts. Uh, you can narrow it down. And we target individuals like people that already like Bernie Sanders, or already like Hillary Clinton, or Wendy Davis, or Leticia Vanderpute, or The Daily Show, just like-minded people, but we promote our down-ballot candidates. So we're bringing individuals in that aren't paying attention to the down-ballot races and highlighting them. And we saw great response from people excited to get to know these candidates more and we would use that through Facebook Smart Targeting, which is a very affordable, um, yet you know, somewhat of a cost to get your, your message out in front of individuals. We regularly have booths at community events. We participate in about 30 community events throughout the county, from our big cities to our rural areas. This is where most of our voter registration goes on. It's also where most people join our email list because they come by, they see the booth, they get involved with us, we sell some merchandise, but more importantly, it creates that first welcome to the individuals gets them involved with our party by getting them on our list and getting them aware of what's going on. We're engaged in our, in our parades throughout the, the county, about 10 a year, again in our big cities but also in our rural areas. Uh, we love going into the rural areas because it helps with that pride building. There's Democrats everywhere, even if there aren't as many, so we like to put our float in there, be there, and build that encouragement of those individuals, and then they'll take the next step after seeing us to get more engaged with us and help build our rural and external areas. Um, and also we do other forms of social media, Twitter, uh, any, any avenue you can think of. It, it, it engages most people, but it also helps us engage younger people. And that's important in Williamson County where we've had such an older electorate. So uh, engaging is uh, vital to that. Fundraising, 
Now, our fundraising numbers may not seem near as impressive to what you see in Travis County sometimes, but we did increase fundraising by $30,000 last year to close to around 70000 A big part of that came off of uh, fundraising for the, our Get Out the Vote efforts, and all of the money that we brought in we put back into the grassroots initiative. We had uh, campaign manager for the cycle. We brought in paid block walkers and phone bankers, and we find that doing this, we're able to supplement what our volunteers are doing. Volunteers, of course, are the best, and you want them, and you want them to go, but these individuals we have staying active, you know, six, seven days a week, so we're keeping the presence and hitting the numbers higher that we need to get to. Uh, we started a awards dinner this year. Um, it was a bit risky for Williamson County Democrats because we had a $100 ticket, which is pretty high for us. I don't think we'd done anything beyond 50 in the past. And we brought in former Governor Mark White, uh, the only living Democratic governor of Texas, and uh, Senator Leticia Vanderpute. It was a great event. We sold about 120 tickets. Uh, it was our first one. We're going to have another one. I hope you all will check it out. It's going to be sometime in September. We have not announced our speakers yet, though. Um, so these, this type of fundraising was brought in, but it was used with the direct purpose of our goal, which is electing Democrats in Williamson County. We've also been building support clubs. So I know you all have some clubs throughout your county as well. We've got Sun City Dems, which covers our North Georgetown area. It's been around for a while. And East Williamson County Dems. In the last few years, we've added Western Wilco Dems Club, which is the grassroots club I was talking about earlier. We've also added Democratic Women of Wilco, our DWOW, our Young Dems Club, and the Round Rock Dems. All of these clubs have a direct purpose and a partnership with our party, and that's to either work their geographical area or to work their constituency, and we're targeting individuals that we need to engage more. We find that these clubs, although we'll have a lot of overlap with regular involved party Democrats, they all bring in a significant number of individuals that only participate with us through those clubs. So by engaging these clubs, we're able to build our grassroots, I like to call it our grassroots army, and we all come together during our get out the vote effort. So it's been an avenue with direct purpose to direct groups that helps us build our, our strength for mobilizing our get out the vote efforts. And finally, we've got to build pride as will in Williamson County. In 14, the common mantra that you would hear everywhere you would go was, I didn't know there were other Democrats in Williamson County. People would say it over and over, or they'd whisper, hey, I'm a Democrat. There was this like embarrassment or fear of being a Democrat in Williamson County. The party officers agreed that this had to end, not only because it's self-defeating, but also we were getting 40 to 45% of the vote. So although we didn't have elected offices, there are a lot of Democrats in Williamson County, almost every other house. So this is something that we had to tackle. I was just in Tom Green County, and I talked to them about the same idea, and they're only about 30 to 33% of the vote, but the same thing there, the same principle. That means one in three houses are a Democrat. So although it seems far off, they've got to build that pride because it gets more people to get out and get involved. So, so we shut it down. We don't let that conversation go on anymore. When new people come in and say it, we remind them of the statistics. We let them know that we're now winning races, and we ask them to not perpetuate that self-defeating prophecy. So we're, we're trying to kill this idea of there aren't Democrats in Williamson County, and we're doing that by building pride in being an outspoken, proud Democrat in Williamson County. Now, of course, part of our success is that Austinites are moving into to Williamson County for affordable housing. But a big part of the success came from running a coordinated campaign. We targeted voters and hit them over and over again. In the end, we did have great success with Jimmy Flanagan winning the Austin City Council race with 56% of the vote, and Terry Cook won her commissioner's court race with 51% of the vote. Another note is that Hillary Clinton beat Donald Trump in Round Rock, our biggest city. Beyond winning, what we really did was show that with hard work over time, you can flip red precincts and find victory anywhere. We didn't flip these precincts by winning over Republicans. That is an incredibly time-consuming and challenging task with next to no reward. We engaged people that were not voting and we pulled them into the process. People want to be taken seriously and talked to. When we knock on doors, people would say things like, nobody ever comes to my door and asks for my vote and support. They were so inspired that we would take the time to simply ask them to vote for our candidates and engage with us in the process. If you do this enough times, it ultimately will pay off. I hope this has been giving you a little bit of an understanding of where Williamson County has been and what we have done to find electoral success despite the challenges. I want to continue just for a few minutes and talk a bit about what we are doing now 
to build on our success and enhance our program in Williamson County. So on your handout, if you flip to the other side, title, What Do We Do Now? Well, I hope it's clear that Williamson County no longer believes in interim years. We do not take an off year, and we, we stay engaged. We do that by participating in our May municipal elections, which are big in our county and happen every year, our November constitutional election, and then, of course, our general election in November uh, every other year. We also participate, as I said, in our primaries, especially uncontested ones where the county can take an initiative because we have to stay out of contested primaries. We are currently running nine candidates in Williamson County in the May 6th elections. We've got two women running for city council in Cedar Park, uh, Ann Duffy and Heather Jeffs. They're running for Cedar Park City Council, and I, I'd like to point out that Cedar Park does come into Travis County, so it's another opportunity for us to coordinate with the Travis County Democrats, and we're working on that right now. Um, we, that's an initiative that the Travis County Dems took on uh, with Vince Harding and their chair, and that was to help build Central Texas the greater area, and they were great partners with us on that Austin City Council race, and now we're asking them to partner with us again on these Cedar Park races. So we're looking forward to that um, joint work. We're running three candidates in Round Rock. Hilda Montgomery is running for mayor. If she wins, she'll be the first African-American and first woman mayor of Round Rock. We're also running two other women in Round Rock, uh, Tracy Story and Tammy Young for city council spots. In Georgetown, we have a Democrat that's been a long-serving Democrat on the city council running for her third term, Rachel John Rowe, and we're helping her to get reelected. And then we've got a gentleman by the name of David Schrey running in Georgetown for another city council spot. And we also have a Georgetown ISD candidate, Joquita Wilson, and Andrea Linson running for Hutto ISD. So we've got nine candidates. We've hired a campaign manager for this cycle, working to mobilize phone banks for all four of those zones every week. So we've got a weekly phone bank for all four zones. We're also block walking every Saturday and Sunday. So because of this event, I got to get out of block walking today, so thank you. Um, but they're in Round Rock, knocking doors. Uh, and so that's going on. Next weekend, we'll keep migrating through the area. So we're being very engaged for the next six weeks to win some of these elections, hopefully reelect Rachel, and then build on that support. By getting new individuals elected, we're going to build our not only prominent individuals that can help our candidates, but also we're building a bench that then can ultimately run for higher partisan office. We're active in protesting and testifying during the legislative session. Primarily we're doing this by helping to spread the word and keep people aware of upcoming bills and, and times to testify and rallies that are going on at the Capitol. This is just another avenue to keep your party uh, engaged and give an avenue for your people to stay motivated and have opportunities to uh, stay active, which is important. You don't want to lose these individuals, so you want to keep people working all the time. Um, I'm currently serving as the legislative chair for the Texas Democratic Party, uh, party County Chairs Association. It's been an opportunity for me to really engage in the, the legislative session much more thoroughly, and it's also helped me then have more knowledge to take back to our members. So that's been a great opportunity. We will engage, as I said, in the November constitutional election coming up, assuming there will be one. There usually is after a legislative session. Just again, it's another avenue for us to keep the party active, to engage less likely voters, to get them to vote, and then ultimately the more we get them to vote, the more reliable they'll be. In the downtimes, we're working on a voter identification campaign. What I mean by that, in 2016 general election, we had 96,000 people vote with no primary history. So we, we had hundreds of thousands vote, but 96,000 vote with no primary history. I talked about the van a little bit earlier. Without primary history, it's just making an educated guess based on a whole bunch of algorithms, but a lot of times it's wrong. So we're calling these 96,000 people in our downtime through precinct chairs and volunteers and we're doing a one-minute, three-question survey. Do you consider yourself a Democrat or a Republican? Did you vote for Trump or Hillary? Do you vote straight ticket, or do you evaluate each race? If they're a Hillary supporter, or if they're a Democrat, then we also ask for their email. Either way, regardless of the information we get, it benefits us as an organization. Because the ones that identify as a Democrat go into our list for mobilize for get out the vote efforts. The ones that go into our in the Republican list are now identified and without doing that, every campaign, every candidate calls these unknown voters. But if we can identify them and keep them in the database, then it will save all of us time by not wasting calls on votes that we're not going to get. So it benefits us. It's a time-consuming process to call 96,000 people. But think of it this way. If we just get a 10% response rate in this program, we're going to identify close to 10,000 voters, and that's going to really help us in these local elections for council races where you win 
some of these races by 300 votes, some of them by 1,200 votes on the high end. So these, these identification program can really make a difference. For um, I think it's important as a county party and something we're striving to do is to have a culture of inclusion. We're trying to find roles for people. And, you know, I keep reminding myself and our regulars to don't be afraid to delegate a little bit of whatever power we may have because it's important to keep people that they have an investment in your organization. So if we can find them a role either through our committees or with our clubs or any of our, our leadership roles, we find it successful with retention. So that's, that's one of our goals as well. We're working on recruiting and training precinct chairs. Just a year ago, we only had about 35 to 40 percent of our precinct chairs filled. We now have 65 of the 88 precincts occupied with a precinct chair, which makes up about 73 percent, which is one of the highest, if not the highest, percentages in the state. Um, we're working on increasing fundraising. We've seen our sustaining donors in this post-Trump uh, era, or this post-Trump election era, spike. So our, our uh, sustaining donor program is going through the roof. We're still doing our fundraising events. And we're also trying to think outside the box. We do uh, dinners before each of our meetings. Somebody volunteers to cook these dinners. We make about $10 a person off of them. And over the course of a year, we make an extra three to $4,000 on something that really just helps build camaraderie, gives us more social time before our meetings, and makes a little bit of money for the party. We're gonna continue to target in our 100 precincts. We've talked about those all, all afternoon. We're gonna focus on the JP1 race in 2018. This is the same map in Williamson County as the Commissioner 1 race, so they share an identical map. I know it's different here in Travis. But it will be a governor year, so it is a bit more challenging in that sense. But we know we have the voters there, so we're going to go all in. If we can win this Justice of the Peace 1 race, coupled with the Commissioner 1 race, then we will own that section of the county. These are four-year terms, so it gives us time to build stability and build off that success. And then ultimately, that will give us the opportunity to expand our reach and, and target into further out areas of our county. So that's very important. So we're going to continue to do that as well. Now, we have lots of energy in Williamson County right now, but this is happening everywhere. The silver lining of electing Trump to the presidency is people are getting engaged. They are so deeply concerned about this man as our president that they want to do anything that they can to build towards a better future. We have seen this with the indivisible groups that have popped up. We see it with the masses that are coming out to march. I think C-SPAN is hitting viewership records these days. And even back at home in Williamson County, we just had to upgrade our monthly meeting venue because we are having over 200 people show up to our meetings regularly. The energy is high right now and it's important that we maximize on that energy by engaging people and finding roles for everyone. This process has been a whirlwind. I think we have found that reflection and change are hard, but we must all do this from time to time. We must do this personally but also as an organization. That's what this plan did. It looked at what we needed to do to be more competitive, and we went for it. I have a favorite quote from when President Obama was running for the presidency in 2018. I'm sorry, in 2008. He said, in the face of impossible odds, people who love their country can change it. Now, we replaced the word country with county, but it's a bit of a motto for us. If you are committed to a cause, then fight for it. If all of our county parties are doing their best, then we will win statewide and nationally. It's primarily a matter of effort and time. I know we won't win all of these races, but with effort, we can maximize our votes. If you want to take Paul Workman's seat in West Travis County and elect a Democrat, then start working for it. If you want to see us turn Texas blue, then let's work for it together. It may not happen overnight, but if we do our part, it can happen. But we should work all of the time, not just during an election. And if we do the work and put in a little bit more time towards grassroots, then we can win. Let me give you an example of how effective we can be. I'm a big believer in rallies. I think rallies get large groups of people fired up and they inspire us. But we must also commit to the hard work of organizing. We must register voters, make the phone calls, and knock on the doors. I attended the Women's March on Austin, which had 50,000 attendees. It was a great event. If but if everyone that went to that Women's March in Austin makes two hours of volunteer phone calls, we can make three million calls in those two hours. Three million calls could be the difference on election day between winning and losing. One final quote I would like to leave you with comes from another political hero of mine, Paul Wellstone, when he said, we can remake the world daily. With hard work and perseverance, there is little we can't accomplish together. 
I want to thank you all so much for the time to speak today. It's a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very motivating. Hi, I'm Helen LaFlair. Um, Williamson County has been reported as one of the fastest growing areas in the country. To what extent is the influx of new people, particularly from out of state, changing your demographic and therefore changing your political uh, alliances? Sure. I mean, it, it's very extensive. It, it is the fastest growing county in Texas. Until a few years ago, it was the fastest growing county in the nation. Um, they're predicting if these trends hold, it will surpass Travis County in the next 10 years. I don't know if this level of movement will hold, but if it does, we're talking about a big county. Next census will show we're over half a million people. A lot of the migration that we're seeing in some studies is that Californians and progressives are moving into Travis County to be in central Austin, and then longtime Austinites are moving across the county line but staying in Austin so they can still live in Austin but in a much more affordable area. So that is having a major impact. Um, of course it's helping us. Uh, lots of these individuals are progressive voters, so we're seeing an effect from it. We don't want to wait on it forever, so we're staying aggressive with grassroots, but it is playing a major role in helping us to make uh, uh, Williams County more electable. As I said, our Commissioner 1 is Round Rock and Austin Williamson County, so that's where our focus is, and that's all bordering Travis County. I think every precinct that touches Travis County has turned into a blue precinct, so there is a migration effect that's having a role with us. So my question is, you said when you did the uh, phone calling about the uh, voter identification campaign, you had three questions. Yeah. Uh, will you repeat them? Yeah, so the three questions we're asking, we're keeping it simple because we don't know if these are Republicans or Democrats. These are the unknown people that we're contacting over the phone. We're asking them, are you a Republican or a Democrat? We're not giving them a third party option, but our data has it. So we're, a lot of people, if you say, are you an independent, at a higher rate, they'll say they are. But you know, we know when they vote that they're more consistent. So we don't put that as an option, but we do have it as a data mark if they respond that they're an independent or third party. Uh, so we ask their party affiliation. We ask who they voted for in the 16 presidential election, so Trump or Hillary. Again, only giving those two options, but on our data side, having a third spot for other. And then, um, what's the third one? Oh, we ask if they're a straight ticket voter or if they evaluate each race. Um, I think we're, we're trying to do that to see uh, especially for our candidates, they might, if some of these individuals say they're Republican, but say they evaluate each race, now the party probably won't work those individuals, but the candidates could find that beneficial to try to do some persuasive uh, contacts on their campaign's behalf. And then we follow up to ask for an email if they're like-minded so we can get them involved in our party. Oh, so you, so then you send them an email after you talk to Yeah, them? well, so we, the fourth question, if they say they're a Democrat or a Hillary supporter from this last cycle, is we ask for their email. We're just trying to get them into our email universe so they can stay up to date with what's going on. Did, uh, in the campaigns you were involved in in Williamson County, did you experience any voter suppression efforts? You know, we have seen, and I don't want to paint a broad brush that all the Republicans up there do this, because um, they don't, but we have had a few longstanding candidates and elected officials up there, up there that strongly participate in, I think, negative politics. They, 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 try to find something in your background. If they can't find it, then they'll make something up in your background. They do a lot of this with robocalling or uh, on the phone so that it's not as traceable and doesn't create a record. As far as voter suppression, we work closely, though, with our, um, the Republicans and Democrats work pretty well together to pick our election sites, and we work well with our county clerks. And uh, we've seen it be pretty smooth and pretty successful as far as just getting out and voting. Now, um, there's always room for improvement. And I think spreading lies does not help anybody. I wish our campaigns would stay focused on the issues because as the Point Counterpoint series showed, we don't see the world the same way. So we don't have to talk about each other's personal lives to highlight how we're different on issues and let the, that speak to the voters. So. Uh, you mentioned uh, using Facebook. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you target on, on Facebook? Yeah, so Facebook is, is trying to make it easier and easier. Like currently, if you're gonna do paid ads, which is a lot of what we're doing with Facebook or paid ads. You can even, you can narrow it down by zip code. So you can put in the zip codes you want. You can narrow it down by county. And they've also put in the congressional map. So we're able to target it into our congressional map. Um, and then, so that helps you pick where your ad's gonna go. And then on top of that, you can pick other interests to get the people that you want. So we, we pick other like high level democratic interests usually, or the Daily Show helps us get into our younger universe. Um, so 
basically we pick a region and then we say we want our ad to go in this region to people that also like the daily show for example is one thing we can do i know that uh, i've received hundreds of uh, anti-hillary uh facebook ads. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I could never understand how they identified me sure so. well you know you can do other things they're, they're probably partly identifying you as a, a man in in just making a speculation that you're a white man in, in an area and trying to get you into it so that may be it we've also found that the republicans a lot of times don't target as much and they'll they have more money and they'll just blanket areas so um you know we don't have that luxury in the democratic party thank you i'm bill town say i i uh live in travis county but also C cedar park and uh <clears throat> and there's some overlapping i know uh Luis, that's um, yeah. Luis Zervagon is one of yeah, our engaged yeah, presenters. Yeah, so, yeah. so I've visited with with him before. Uh, I was interested in knowing how you, what is a feasible method of identifying age eligible voters who have never voted because actually the uh, the age group that uh, <coughs> with the fewest registration, fewest uh, turnout is. 18 to 25. Sure. Yeah. So how do we get more of our younger? Yeah, so identify, well, we can do a few things. So if they're not registered to vote, I mean, it is complicated. We, we hold regular uh, voter registration booths at our community colleges in Williamson County. So that's not really identifying, but that's going to where they are. Um, another thing, if they've registered before, let's say they registered at some point, but they've never voted, in the van, you can pull people by age, so we can narrow it down to their age and bring up people that have never voted. So we can look at registered individuals under 25 that have never voted and then target them. Now, as far as just if they've never registered, and, um, you know, that's a harder process. Now, I don't think we have access to the driver's that? license registration oh, information. Yeah. Okay, that, uh, yeah. I was talking about driver's license. Yeah, I don't think we have that access. Yeah. I don't think it's incorporated into the van. So it is a bit more challenging to find unregistered, unknown individuals. Something Travis County did that we're trying to work on right now is if you pull a li you can pull a list in the van of everyone that's registered to vote. And so, in a sense, you could go to every house not on the list, and these are all houses where people reside and they're not registered. Now, Travis, and y'all have a great voter registration initiatives that go on down here. Um, yeah he created, I think, a Google map that flipped it. So he put a map of all the houses that don't have anyone registered to vote. So then you can go and, and go to those houses directly. So we've been doing it the inverse at times where we just go to houses that don't make a list, but the tool that he's turned it into here has been fantastic for Travis County. You mentioned uh, Facebook, and are you aware of Russia's use of bots to where if somebody mentioned Hillary Clinton on on Twitter, the, the Russian bot would make duplicate it three thousand times and dilute. You know, oh, man, yeah. I did see an art uh, story on Rachel Maddow this week about kind of how uh, the bots were infiltrating. We saw that it was primarily through Twitter, but they were also infiltrating. It looked like a lot of Bernie Sanders uh, groups on Facebook. I mean, I'm aware of it. I don't. I don't know what to, what our role is in that problem. I mean, our as the county party role is in that problem. Obviously, it needs to be stopped. I I agree, and and it, it's going to dilute our message, and it's going to mislead to the voters, which is kind of you know tied back to examples of voter suppression that's going on. But we have also found that with our direct targeting um, through Facebook, it's been pretty effective, and we get great responses and. And so I think even with that going on, we're still finding it to be an effective tool. Unification of the Democrats. There's a split between the Bernies and the Hillarys. Yeah. And there is as a vast chasm. How do you think you're going to put that together? Sure. So the question is about there's still an ongoing split between uh, the fight we had in the last primary between Bernie Sanders supporters and Hillary supporters. You know, it's a long process to get past these things. These are emotional um, items. We, they're, both these candidates came with a lot of agreeable interests, but some disagreeable interests, and it creates a divide. In Williamson County, we have not seen this divide as much as other parts of the state, and that was partly what we did right off the bat 
was we sat down with the leaders of both groups in our county. We made them both feel welcome. We made it clear to them that they have a place in our county party and we want them in our county party. At the convention, we had shared time at our county convention for both groups. Um, and we've just kind of been in the process of, you know, being strongly welcoming to these individuals all, in the, all along. And we haven't seen near as much divide in Williamson County. But I know it's happening. I think uh, we've got to, as party leaders, push past it. Our first uh, meeting after the election had about 150 people, 160 people show up. First thing I said to them was, I don't care who you voted for in the primary. I don't care if you've never been engaged in the process before. You're not too late. If you want to help us elect Democrats in Williamson County, then this is the place for you. So I think it's hitting that message home. But I know it's a real concern. The state party's talking about it, trying to figure out how we push past it. I think the national party having these two individuals that were identified with both camps and leadership roles will hopefully help in the long run. Um, but, you know, it is a challenge. We're not going to get everybody won over, but we've got to, as leaders, just keep being welcoming, keep being inviting, and making sure that everyone regardless of who they voted for in the primary, including if it was Martin O'Malley, feels that there's a role for them in the county parties. So. Okay. How about fake news? How do you handle this, the lies that come out against you, and how do you respond to them? How do you really correct fake news? Sure. Um, I think with fake news, it's challenging. And, and if we're talking about on a national level, you know, they're going to respond because it's going to get a lot of attention. On a more local level, and I, I talked about it, do we have a candidate? Uh, an elected official that has been chronicled in many cycles constantly spreading rise, lies about his opponent. Um, we tackle it one of two ways. M mainly it's the people that we need to engage to win are not the people that are going to care about that for the most part. There's a little overlap, but to win we have to mobilize like-minded democratic supporting people. So we, we don't get too caught up in talking to people that are going to be engaged by that fake news that often. Um, we really try to target down onto likely Democrats that will vote for us and not spend a lot of time wasting our efforts on persuasive voters, which is almost impossible to do. So I, I think that's part of it. I know it's not the best answer to it because it's a complicated issue and you have to evaluate on each race. I mean, some of the times you ignore it so you don't add more attention to the fake news. Now, if it's, we're talking about the presidential race, it's going to get attention and it's got to be addressed. And, you know, I think we see most of this coming out of one avenue. And hopefully our voters aren't paying attention to that. Well, I thank y'all so much for the opportunity to be here. It's been, it's been quite an honor. I've looked at y'all's list. Y'all have had a lot of amazing people. I don't think I fit the bill, but I am happy and excited to be, to be a part of it. So thank you, and thank you all for your support. Travis County has been a great friend of Williamson County Democratic Party, and we've been working together. It's been very beneficial. So. Thank you very much for coming. Right. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> thank you, y'all.